All right, today we are going to have what I consider to be my really fun lecture about infinity. We're going to talk about infinity uh, in some pretty fun ways, I think. I'm not really actually going to follow the book to, in great detail. I'm going to be less formal with infinity than we are in this real analysis class to the textbook. We're going to make a bunch of pictures, and we are going to um, try to have fun with it, OK? I do want to address some homework problems that you turned in today. Anybody else need to turn in homework, by the way? Should be here a few minutes before this point to try to turn it in. Uh, I do want to look at those because there are some important points to bring out. But, but let me first whet your appetite for infinity by talking about something called the ping pong ball conundrum. Okay, I did not make this up. This credit goes to Edward Berger and Michael Starberg from their book, The Heart of Mathematics, which we use in creative problem solving here at Bethel. Um, it's a really cool conundrum here, and I made Mathematica code about the conundrum, okay? What else am I gonna do? Yeah, I spent a couple hours yesterday afternoon trying to figure this out. Uh, and look at that, infinity barrel. I wonder what that's about. Let's run this code here and see what happens. Okay, so there we have the infinity barrel, and we've got some numbered circles there. What are those numbered circles? Those are ping pong balls. I could have made a track for the ping pong balls to slide down. I didn't bother. The ping pong balls are going to go in the barrel, and in fact, I should let before we run this, I should let you know that these ping pong balls go off to infinity. There's one ping pong ball for every natural number, okay? So we see the first three here, one, two, three. As they start moving the slider, as they start letting time go by, we see these ping pong balls going into the infinity barrel. We see the four there, five, six, et cetera. They're coming in, coming in. So far about 10 seconds have gone by and we have about uh, three, uh, two, almost three balls in the barrel. And then, as we approach 30 seconds, there's 7, 8, 9, 10. As we approach 30 seconds, or we're at 18 seconds here is when I did it. I could have done it differently. We take ping pong ball number one out of the barrel. Okay, so now we're getting really close to 30 seconds. You see the first 10 went in the barrel, but we're taking one out. So ultimately, after the first 30 seconds, we got ping pong balls two through 10 in the barrel. But then when we get to 30 seconds, now we bring in more ping pong balls. 11 through 20, in fact. They continue going in the barrel. And they're actually going in faster. Now, you can't really see it so well since I'm sliding it by hand. They're going in faster than they were before. And when we get close to 45 seconds elapsed, well, we'll have uh, numbers 19 and 20 showing up as well, but we're going to take ping pong ball two out of the barrel. Watch it here. Here comes two out of the barrel. And when we get to 45 seconds, we are, we definitely have ping pong balls three through 20 in the barrel, okay? Now, what do you know about 45 seconds compared to 30 seconds in a minute? Well, it's, you know, 30 seconds went by in the first time interval. 15, half of 30 went by in the second time interval to get ping pong balls three through 20 in the barrel and one and two are now out of the barrel. When we get to 45 seconds, we continue with ping pong balls 21 through 30. Hmm, what's gonna happen now? They're going in even faster than before. And in fact, what's half of 15 is seven and a half. After seven and a half more seconds, when we get to 52.5 seconds, we will have ping pong balls, well, four through 30 in the barrel, because three's gonna come out here now, right? Now, there, here comes three, it's coming out of the barrel. So by the time we get to 52.5 seconds, we're gonna have ping pong balls four <coughs> through 30 in the barrel. We did put one, two, and three in there, but we took them out. Can you guess the pattern? Seven and a half seconds, cut that in half to 3.75 seconds. Starting at time 52.5, we're gonna start putting 31 through 40 in the barrel. And when we get to, let's see, 52.5 plus 3.75, what would that be? 56.25, did I do that right? 
we're going to have, well, there comes four out of the barrel. We're going to have five through 40 in the barrel. And then we're going to cut time in half again. What's half of 3.75? 1.875, is that right? Did I do that right? I'm afraid I did it wrong, but oh well. We're going to take, we're putting 41 through 50 in the barrel, but we're taking five out. We keep cutting the time in half. We keep, now we're going to put, then we're going to put uh, 51 through 60 and take six out, and then 61 through 70 and take seven out. And in the end, we get to 60 seconds. One minute has gone by, and well, we've done an infinite number of things. Ignore the word null there. Essentially, that was my little computer program crashing when you 60 because I didn't program it to go out that far. You can continue doing that process, speeding up twice as fast over each half interval of time. Here's the question. At the end of a minute, what balls are in the barrel? And beyond. Infinity and beyond is so that we have a vote for infinity and beyond. What balls are in the barrel? After the first 30 seconds, it was 2 through 10. After the next 15 seconds, it was what, 3 through 20. After the next 7 and a half seconds, it was 4 through 30. Is that constantly changing? It is constantly changing, and I, but I keep taking half intervals and going twice as fast. And uh, evidently, this process of going faster and faster is happening until you get to 60 when it's got to stop. Guess what? Does anybody feel confident that they know the answer? You never get to 60 seconds, right? Well, we're pretending we do. <laughs> we do have to go infinitely faster, which means we're going faster than the speed of light, which, of course, is impossible but in real life. But this is a mental experiment. <laughs> there are no pink balls. Say it again? No pink pong balls. There are no ping pong balls in the barrel. That's the right answer. What? First there was 2 through 10, then 3 through 20, it kept getting bigger than that. <laughs> there are no ping pong balls in the barrel. How? What? Let's run, let's run it. <laughs> let's run it at a regular time. We'll, we'll let it run for a minute here. Slower, slower, slower. <laughs> this is almost real time here. Let me start it over. Ah. This is almost real time here. We're close to it. Watch the balls go in the barrel. Let it run here. Zoom in if you need to. You see they are all numbered. Can you see that with the camera? There comes one. Ending up for 30 seconds. That's pretty close to real time to me. 8, 30, 9, 30. Here they come faster than before. I took one out. One comes out for sure. Two comes out for sure. It's not in the barrel. Faster and faster. Three comes out for sure. Here it comes right now. There goes three. Four comes out. Five comes out. Six. Seven, eight, nine. Okay, I, of course, I can't continue that process, that code forever. Okay, there's a finite amount of code. So I had to stop it somewhere. Because you can say the moment in time when every number natural was pulled out, that means the barrel's empty. One came out in 30 seconds, two came out about 45 seconds, by 45 seconds, three came out by 52.5 seconds, four came out by, uh, what was it again, 56.25 seconds. You keep cutting that interval in half. You take out every ball before you get to 60 seconds. How can it be? It's a conundrum. It seems like a paradox. The ping pong ball conundrum. Infinity's got lots of strange things that happen with it. Have you heard of Zeno's paradox? Anybody think they can state it? Just wait. Be sure. Excuse me on camera. How can I ever reach that computer? Because to get there, I have to cover half the distance then half the distance again, then half the distance again, then half the distance again. How am I ever going to reach it? Well, of course I do. 
Zeno was a Greek philosopher who thought about that, who argued then that any motion is impossible because for any small motion, you'd have to cover half the distance and half the distance and half the distance. So how are you ever going to get there from here to there? Of course, we know that we do move. So it's a paradox. Paradoxes can be resolved. Maybe the result of Zeno's paradox, I don't know, maybe you have to get into quantum physics. Maybe is, is time, does time have a discrete nature in reality instead of a continuous nature? I don't know for sure. I think some physicists think so. Okay, before we come back to infinity, let's do some actual real analysis where we are thinking about things carefully. Let's take a look at the problems that you did for today. I hope with enough struggle that you got them. And then you got them with pretty short, elegant proofs. You can do these problems with pretty short and elegant proofs. Let's take a look at them. If you, all, if you want to look in your book, you can. First, let's take a look at problem number 12 uh, from section 1.2, page 17. Suppose you're given two real numbers. Suppose x is less than a plus epsilon for all positive numbers epsilon. Prove, in fact, that x is less than or equal to a. Probably the most direct proof here is by contradiction. That's kind of a, an oxymoron. The most direct proof is by contradiction. Mm -hmm. Contradiction is also called indirect proof. That's why it's an oxymoron. Okay. Assume to the contrary. that x is greater than a. Let me not finish the sentence here. Right, right there, let me add. So x minus a is bigger than zero. I'm going for the most elegant proof that I can write. Okay, This is going to be short and sweet. Short and sweet means elegant. Or synonymous with elegant, elegant basically. Then, okay. Annie showed me her proof was like this. It was, what do you do? Um, do a plus x minus a. Well, okay, let me add something in here. Then x is less than a plus x minus a. Because x minus a is, is positive, it can be treated as an epsilon. I don't have to say let it equal epsilon, I could. But that equals x. Done. That's a contradiction. x can't be less than itself. If it is more clear to you, you could say over here, let epsilon equal x minus a. So x is less than x plus epsilon. Oops. Oops. Less than a plus epsilon which equals a plus x minus a, which equals x. You could do it that way if that's more clear to you. The x minus a is acting like the epsilon in your hypothesis. But again, that's the contribution. I told you about the two arrows pointing at each other. Right? That's not a star, that's two arrows pointing at each other. Contribution. Meaning your original assumption of the contrary must be false, therefore x is less than or equal to a. Might not be a bad idea to put that as the last sentence, but I'm not going to write it. Technically speaking, that's good enough to emphasize its contradiction. But for clarity's sake, you might also want to add, therefore, the assumption of the contrary must be false, and therefore x must be less than or equal to a. Short, gets you to the right conclusion. That's elegance. All right, let's go on to the next example. Number eight and 1.3. Prove a non-empty set that is bounded above has only one supreme one.
it is assumed without staying in here that this set is a subset of the real numbers. Okay. Not the complex numbers or something. Do they say other real numbers? We could. But unless stated otherwise, you can always assume your sets are going to be subsets of the real numbers. That is bounded above. My abbreviation for bounded is DDD. Has only one supreme. Perhaps it's best to do that by contradiction as well. Suppose you've got a subset of the real numbers that is bounded above. Let this be bounded above. And let beta 1 and beta 2 be two distinct. Soups of S. Okay. Soup is an abbreviation for, abbreviation for supremum. Soups is going to be our abbreviation for supremums, or supremo might be the best plural. But we'll just say soups. Two distinct soups of S. What do you think I should write next? Uh, there's an abbreviation that would be good to write. A four letter abbreviation. Log half. With almost a generality, beta 1 is less than beta 2. You're basically done. It almost proves itself, okay? They're both soups of S, they're both suprema of S. Therefore, you could say beta 2 is the least upper bound, but hey, beta 1 is less than beta 2, so it can't be an upper bound, because that's what it means to be a least upper bound. Contradiction. Done. It's okay if I don't write that out. You could also say beta 1 is the least upper bound and beta 2 is bigger than it, so it can't be the least upper bound. You can do it either way. I'll say those again. You can either do it by saying beta 2 is the soup, it's the least upper bound, beta 1 is less than it, so it can't be an upper bound, so it also can't be the soup. Or you could say beta 1 is the least upper bound, and beta 2 is bigger than it, so it can't be the least upper bound of S. It's always good to add the phrase of S. Okay? Should write another sentence, but I'm not bothering to. Okay, these proofs are a little strange. And they're tricky, but once you see the trick, they're actually pretty short. Number 12, let us be a non-empty set of real numbers. <laughs> as far as style of proof, do you mm -hmm. want us to like kind of state what we know and then say proof and then start there to show you where our proof is starting? Or do you, well, you don't have to restate the problem if that's the first question. You don't have to restate the problem. You can, if, it, if it's helpful for you, you can say, I'm assuming this and I want to show that at various spots in the proof. If that's helpful for you. I'm just it's not. more concerned about what you're looking for. I will, I will grade the proof as uh, full credit if it is technically correct, okay. logically correct. Um, I, this elegance thing you should just strive for. Yeah. It's better for you in terms of just learning how to write elegant proofs. And it's also easier for me, because then it makes your proofs easier to read and easier to grade. But I will struggle through long, unpleasant, unelegant proofs if I have to to get you a score, OK? But it does need to be technically correct. OK, S is a subset of the real numbers. S is bounded above. Remember, 12 here, not just bounded, but bounded above is the thing we're assuming here. 
prove for all positive epsilon there exists an x in s such that x is bigger than beta minus epsilon. Big word of warning, do not assume s is an integral here. It's an arbitrary subset of the real numbers that's bounded above, not necessarily an integral. So therefore, the, I mean, the, the thing that people often say is, well, just pick um, x to be some number between beta minus epsilon and beta. It's a not integral. But you don't know it's an s. That's the problem. s is not necessarily an inter interval. But the proof's not that hard once you see what to do. And you should do what I said in the note that I sent you the other day. You should, as your first sentence, say, let epsilon greater than zero be given. You want to prove this is true for all epsilon greater than zero. So the standard way to do that is to say, give me an arbitrary positive epsilon. And here's the main point I'm trying to make. Give me an arbitrary positive epsilon. If I can show the conclusion holds for that arbitrary positive epsilon, then this if-then statement, essentially, this implication will be true for all epsilon greater than zero. So I want you to start with this. Let epsilon greater than zero be given. In fact, I want you to pretend it's a stamp. You've got some, an ink pad, and you just put it there. Let epsilon greater than zero be given. At the start of this kind of proof where you are trying to prove something follows for all epsilon greater than zero. That kind of proof. Not any kind of proof, that kind of proof. Since beta is the soup of S, which we know exists, since S is non empty and bounded above, I should say S is non empty. Did they say that? Yeah, S is non empty, that's the empty set. It's not equal to the empty set. Since beta is the soup, which is the least type of bound, Beta minus epsilon is not an upper bound of S. And we're basically done. Because what does it mean to not be an upper bound of S? It means there's something in S that's bigger than beta minus epsilon. Done. It's just unpacking that definition here. Therefore, there exists an S, X and S, such that x is bigger than beta minus epsilon. QED, PTL, whatever you want. Praise the Lord. It's that short. And that does it, that you got at the key issues. Epsilon is a po arbitrary positive number. There is an x bigger than beta minus epsilon because beta is the least upper bound. Beta minus epsilon is not an upper bound of us. There must be something in us that's bigger than beta minus epsilon. That, that's it. But that doesn't mean S is an interval. It could be a finite set of points. It could be a, a sequence of points, an infinite sequence. Okay. There are lots of things that S could be. All right, on to the fun stuff about infinity here. Well, okay. I do have in this section a polished polished proof that square root of 2 exists. I don't want to read it to you here, because that's kind of boring. But I, I, I will put this on Moodle, and I would suggest that you uh, look it through. It's a nice logical proof. Based on the scratch work we did the other day, last Friday, it's a nice logical proof that the square root of 2 exists. Okay? So I would encourage you to read that. Uh, I'm going to skip the crazy function parts here because we need to get to infinity. I, I do want to show you a couple crazy functions, maybe on Friday. I should also mention before we get to infinity that you should definitely pay attention to the Archimedean property, which, which you cannot prove just with ordered field properties. Even though the rationals, for example, are an ordered field and do actually satisfy the Archimedean property because they're a subset of the reals, you in this framework, you need the completeness axiom to prove it. So you should make sure you read that. 
TFSAE means the following statements are equivalent. These are all the Archimedean property. All four of those statements here mean the same thing essentially, and you can use them whenever you need them. I don't want to spend time talking about them, but I, but I will show you I made some code. That illustrates it here. Given any true positive numbers, there is some whole number multiple of the smaller one that eventually gets you higher than the bigger one is the, is the part of what it's saying here. Okay. All right, let's get on to infinity. I am going to start a little bit formally here, but ultimately we're going to have lots of fun with infinity and draw a bunch of pictures on the board. Okay. But I think it is good just to be a little bit formal at the beginning. Thank you. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> to talk about what it means for two sets to have the same cardinality. The book alludes to this idea of cardinality, but they kind of um, take a slightly different approach after alluding to it. Here's a definition. This definition applies to any sets, not just sets of real numbers. Let A and B be any two sets. And I do mean any two sets. One could be a set of numbers. One could be a set of colors. You could have a set of suits of cards. You could have sets of people. OK, any sets whatsoever. We say A and B have the same Cardinality, kind of a strange word. The same cardinality if. Who taught algebraic structures? Turnquist. Have you ever used the word bijection? Sure. We're talking about <laughs> iso isomorphisms or bijections. Does anybody know what bijection means? Bijection. Uh -huh. That's if it's on to and one to one. Yep, you got it. If it's on to and one to one, you got to get a space on the string. If there exists a bijection, I'm being kind of fancy here using that word, a one to one and on to function from A to B, or from B to A, it doesn't matter. This is a one to one. And on to function. It's a pairing, so to speak. Every element of A gets paired up with a unique element of B, and every element of B is paired up with a unique element of A. One to one means distinct inputs give you distinct outputs. No two different points get mapped to the same point. Onto means every point over in the Fargate set is an output for some input. Okay, then I'm just saying those verbally. Isomorphisms, group isomorphisms, ring isomorphisms, those are bijections. Actually, when it's a one to one, you can also call it an injection. And when it's onto, you can call it a surjection. Okay, you don't need to know. Argo calls it a one-to-one -one correspondence. That's, that's the way they phrase it. That's what it says um, for two sets that have the same cardinality. Um, you let the absolute value of a set? No. It just looks like absolute value. It's kind of analogous to absolute value. Equal the, the cardinality of A, which, I, I'm not being very precise here, which is equal to the number of elements in A, if A is finite. Number of elements in A, if A is finite. 
although I haven't said what finite is yet, although you intuitively know. I should have defined finite first. And uh, something else. If A is infinite. Okay, I, I should have defined finite and infinite first. And you know you intuitively know what those are. Let me define finite and infinite for, uh, over here. I should have done what I'm about to do first. A set is finite a set A that's the word A that's a set A a set A is finite if it has the same cardinality as the set 1, 2, 3, through n for some positive integer n. I use fancy n for the natural numbers. The book uses z plus positive integer. That's what it means for a set. I guess I didn't need the letter a in there set A to be finite. It has the same cardinality as this set. In other words, there is a bijection, a one-to-one -one correspondence from A to that set, a function that maps every element of A to a unique element of B, and no two elements of A get mapped to the same thing. And every, every element over here is mapped um, to by the function. Something in A gets mapped to A. You can pair things up, OK? You can label A in such a situation as A1, A2, through AN. That's the way you could label A when you know it's finite. Label the elements of A. Doesn't mean they're in order, and A doesn't even have to be a, a set of real numbers, so no ordering necessary. A set A is infinite. Not if there's a bijection to say all the natural numbers, but just if it's not finite. Infinite means not finite. So there is no bijection to a set of this form. Set A is said to be countably infinite, countably infinite, if it's a certain kind of infinite set, if there exists, um, well, if, if A has the same cardinality as the cardinality of the natural numbers. Go ahead and use that notation. If there exists a bijection from A to the set of natural numbers. You might also want to write that too. If there exists a bijection from A to the set of natural numbers. A set A is uncountable. If A is infinite, and there is no bijection from A to the set of natural numbers, you could say the cardinality is different. But I would encourage you to also write, there is no bijection from A to the set of natural numbers. Now, Clearly, n itself is, is uh, countably infinite because you can match elements of n up with themselves. One gets mapped to one, two gets mapped to two, three gets mapped to three, etc. 
it's not clear that there are even any uncountable sets. What if there are no infinite sets that cannot be paired up with elements of M one to one? Well, this is going to get fun here. Okay, hang with me. First fact, fact one. We're going to be building up some interesting facts here. The set of all even natural numbers is countably kind of infinite. Can I do that? 2z. So as the first, for the set of all, uh, that would be the even integers. I want to do the even natural numbers. 2n. n is not a group. Z is a group. Like Z is a ring. But okay, this is my notation for the set of all positive natural numbers that are even. This is countably infinite. Um, one definition that I skip, by the way, is what it means for a set to be countable. Countable means either finite or countably infinite. And uncountable is not countable. <laughs> okay? Be another way to approach this. Fact one. What's the proof? I've got to come up with a bijection from two n to n to show they have the same cardinality. A one to one on two function. Define f from uh, 2n to n, you can actually do it the other way as well from n to 2n. By f of n equals n over 2. This okay. Have you seen this in the kind of notation before? Did turn press use it? Put the function in, a colon, domain, codomain, arrows indicating it's a function mapping. The elements of the domain to the codomain. Define a function with this domain and this codomain with this formula. Not going to finish the proof, because we've got a lot of things to do still here. But I want you to believe it's pretty easy to finish. Definitely, this function is well defined. Give me any even positive integer, even natural number. N over 2 is going to be still a natural number. You know that. It's not something you have to prove. Is it 1 to 1 and on 2? Yep. Give me two distinct even numbers. When you divide them by 2, they're still distinct. 1 to 1. Is it on 2? Give me an arbitrary natural number, whether even or odd. If I multiply it by 2, that was the number that gets mapped to it. For example, if the number I'm thinking about is 7, 14 gets mapped to 7. If I'm thinking about 8, 16 gets mapped to 8. For every integer, if you multiply it by 2, that's the number in the domain that got mapped to it, that gets mapped to it. It's a 1 to 1 and on 2 function from this to this. This set is countably infinite. It's got the same cardinality as the natural numbers, even though it's got fewer elements. Should I use that word fewer? There's no odds in here. Hmm. Fact two. I could continue along this vein and continue considering like set of all multiples of three, set of all multiples of four, and show those are all countably infinite. Or I could start having fun and show that, let's just write this fact as an equation. Z is countably infinite. The set of all integers, meaning include zero and negative integers as well. It's a little trickier finding a one to one and on two function from Z to N, or from N to Z. 
It's extra tricky, though not super hard, to find a formula for such a function. We are going to be satisfied with the picture. And actually, in some cases, the book is satisfied with the picture, too. Making a little chart here. The natural numbers are up here. The integer is going to be down there. I am going to indicate a one-to-one -one and onto function by a pattern rather than a formula. I need to say what each natural number gets matched up with in the integers, and I need to guarantee that it's a one-to-one -one and onto function that's pairing these things up. That can be done pretty easily with a pattern. In the following way, for example, let that pattern continue. So the idea here is the function, this time I'm letting n be the domain, maps 1 to 0, 2 to 1, 3 to negative 1, 4 to 2, 5 to negative 2, 6 to 3, 7 to negative 3, 8 to 4, 9 to negative 4, etc. 5, negative 5, 6, negative 6, 7, negative 7. It's one to one. Two, di two distinct numbers in the natural are going to map to the distinct integers. That's clear from the pattern. And it's on to give me any integer, like oh, um, 100. What gets mapped to it? I guess by the pattern it would be uh, um, 200. It gets mapped to 100. What about 101? Excuse me, what about negative 100? I guess by the pattern it would be 201. 200 gets mapped to 100. 201 by the pattern would get mapped to negative 100. Negative 100. You could argue this is definitely a one to one and on to correspondence, a one to one correspondence. That's true. Fact three. Here we're starting to get surprising. The sum of all rational numbers is countably infinite. Has the same cardinality as the set of natural numbers. That's definitely less obvious. I mean, think about a number line. You know that between any two real numbers, no matter how close they are, there is a rational in there. In fact, you could say there's infinitely many rationals in any little tiny interval. Yet somehow, the rationals are going to have the same cardinality as the natural numbers. They are countably infinite. How in the world would you prove such a thing? Again, we're not going to do it rigorously because we're not going to come up with a formula. But I'm going to draw a diagram that helps you believe this fact. different ways to draw this diagram. Here's how I'm going to do it. It's an infinite diagram. And by the pattern that you see here, think about it, every rational number is somewhere in this diagram. It goes on forever with the indicated pattern. In fact, every rational number um, except zero is in this diagram infinitely often. 1, 1, 1, 1 half, 1 half, 3, 6 would be 1 half, etc. Every number is not only in this diagram, every rational number, but it's in there infinitely often. So how am I going to come up with the bijection from n to q with this diagram? I'm going to start in the middle with 0, and by circling that and starting there, I'm indicating that 1 gets mapped to 0. The natural number 1 gets mapped to 0. 
Then I'm going to go around the diagram in a spiraling pattern. <coughs> By circling that next, that means 2 gets mapped to 1. Circling this way, 3 gets mapped to negative 1. Continuing to spiral, 4 is going to get mapped to a half. Should I go there or there? It doesn't matter. I guess I better go here. Um, skip that one because that's 1. We already know 2 gets mapped to 1, so we skip that one. Go over here, where am I at? 1 gets mapped there, 2, 3, 4, 5 gets mapped to 2. 6 gets mapped to negative a half. Skip this one, it's already been done. 7 gets mapped to negative, um, skip that one too. No. Okay, no, don't skip it. 7 gets mapped to negative 2. 8 gets mapped to 1 third, 9 to 2 thirds, 10 to 3 halves, 11 to 3, etc. Spiral around. Every integer is going to get mapped to something unique because of the skipping when you have to repeat. And every rational number gets hit eventually. So this diagram indicates, helps you believe, without being a rigorous proof, that this is true. Okay, hang with me here. Okay, it gets more fun. Okay, it's even more fun. Actually, I saw a professor here before me for this once. I I wrote it down somewhere. I can't. I, I don't know where I wrote it down. Maybe it's maybe in my um, bookshelf somewhere or my uh, filing cabinets, paper. Not electronic stuff. I saw a professor give a formula for that. Fact four. The set of real numbers does not have the same cardinality as the set of natural numbers. And in fact, people even write the set of real numbers, the cardinality, is strictly greater than. Ah, strictly greater than the cardinality of the natural numbers. The set of real numbers is uncountable. It is a bigger size of infinity. What? The bigger size of infinity. It's, you can definitely say this too, the cardinality of the natural numbers is less than the cardinality of the reals because definitely there's an injective function, one to one, from the naturals into the reals, but there's no, no such function as an onto function. The book gives a nice proof of this. It's a very nice proof, actually, based on the completeness axiom. You should read and study that proof. I will probably go over it some on Friday, so, uh, maybe just with a picture. Actually, I'd encourage you to draw a picture as you read the book's proof. They even draw a picture for you, but you can redraw it. It's a pretty nice proof that actually, once you study it and understand it, you, you probably could believe you could come up with it with maybe some hints. Instead, I'm going to do what's called Cantor's Diagonalization argument. Diagonalization argument. It's even funnier than this. Actually, any tiny little interval of real numbers, no matter how small, A and B could be super close together, has a bigger cardinality than the subnatural numbers. To a mathematician, that's kind of fun. No matter how small. Okay, again, I'm not going to write out the argument as a literal argument with words and sentences. I'm just going to draw a diagram again. And in this diagram, 
The numbers that I put on the left are going to be elements of the natural numbers, and the elements that I put on the right are going to be numbers in the open interval from 0 to 1. Now, what kind of argument could you possibly do to prove this? To prove this is true. Contradiction. Assume to the contrary that these are equal, these cardinalities. That R and Zn have the same size of infinity. Assume to the contrary that R is countably infinite. Then there must be some one to one correspondence. Some pairing here, every natural number being paired up with a unique number in the interval from 0 to 1. <clears throat> Another reason this is not going to be rigorous is because we're going to use decimal representations. Every number between 0 and 1 can be represented by a decimal. And just for the sake of clarity, assume we're not using the um, alternative representation of some decimals with an infinite number of nines. Okay? Assume we're doing that for clarity. Now, you don't know what this correspondence is. But since you're assuming to the contrary that this is not true, there must be some correspondence. So there must be some decimal here. That gets map, matched up with 1. Those A's are digits, 0 through 9. There must be some decimal representation of some number between 0 and 1 that gets matched up with 2. With 3, etc. It's like you have an infinite matrix here on the right. And every number between 0 and 1, every real number, has got to be in here somewhere. I'm about to now create, get a contradiction by creating a number that can't possibly be over there. Define x to be 0 0.B1, B2, B3, etc., where B1 is a digit not equal to A1. What is A1? I don't know. A11, I should say. What is A11? Say it's 7. Pick something other than 7 for B1. The second digit is not equal to A22. Second digit after the decimal in the second number in the right. What is A22? I don't know. If it were 3, pick something different than 3. B3 is different from A33, etc. That pattern continues. You are making sure this number you're creating does not match these numbers along the diagonal of this diagram. That's why it's called Kenner's diagonalization argument. And therefore you've created a number that is not in this list. And that's a contradiction. <coughs> right? It can't be the first one because it doesn't match the first digit. It can't be the second one because it doesn't match the second digit. It can't be the third because it doesn't match the third, etc. What are these cardinalities? The cardinality of the natural numbers has a special symbol. It's called Elph Not. It kind of looks like this. It's actually a uh, Hebrew letter, Elph. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. What about the cardinality of the reals? What should we call that? Well, some people write it like this. 2 to the L of naught. What does it mean to raise 2 to an infinite cardinal number? What? Other times, people just abbreviate C for continuum, really big, kind of like the speed of light is really big, and C represents the speed of light in physics. This is not the speed of light. 
C here stands for continuum. Okay, maybe for extra emphasis we make it bold face. C. Is there any cardinal number between these two cardinal numbers? Hang with me here a few moments. Is there any number between these two cardinal numbers? Cantor hypothesized that there wasn't. That there's no infinite set that is not countable, yet is also less than the cardinality of the real set. He struggled for years to try to prove it or disprove it. And the story is he went crazy because of it. I don't know if that was the main reason. <laughs> it's called the continuum hypothesis that there is no cardinality between these two. And the answer to the continuum hypothesis was completely unexpected. The continuum hypothesis can be proved to neither be true nor false. It can be proven to neither be true nor false. It's not true and it's not false. It's undecidable, so to speak. And what does that mean? It really means it should be an axiom. That's what it means. It's a statement independent of our usual axioms. Hang with me a little bit more. I'm going to point you to some videos online that are going to help you explore this a little bit further. But let me just say, to conclude today, that this fun with infinity can keep going. There are not only two sides of infinity, there are infinitely many sides of infinity. And ultimately, you can get to the biggest, I call it the ultimate paradox, the ultimate contradiction. And I can phrase it in one question. Does the set of everything contain itself? What is the set of everything? I mean the set of everything, the collection of all things. All numbers, all letters, all colors, all people, all atoms, all ideas. Does the set of everything, does it contain itself? It must, because it contains everything. But how can a set contain itself? How do you resolve that? That does seem like the ultimate paradox, doesn't it? How do you resolve it? We'll talk about that briefly on Friday.